Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Tonight, we hope you find a very interesting conversation about the grace of God with a Dominican priest who is the theologian of the papal household. Now, before we get to the papal theologian, we want to talk with EWTN Radio's general manager, Mr. Jack Williams, about some new things happening at radio. Jack, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, Father Mitch? Fine, fine. What do you got going well, on? Well, we do have some exciting stuff. This is the first opportunity that I've had to be with you here on EWTN Live since the beginning of 2019. Mm -hmm. And in January, we started a couple of new programs. What you got? Uh, EWTN favorite Brian Patrick mm -hmm. uh, has developed a new program for us that airs on Saturday mornings and Saturday afternoons. It's mm -hmm. called The Church Alive. Mm -hmm. So he's paired up with Dr. Matthew Bunsen, who is fantastic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Father Thomas Petrie from the the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., and they take a look, you know, we, we live in a culture where uh, news in America from a Catholic perspective is hard to find. Mm -hmm. So it's very important what we're doing here at EWTN, the way that we've bolstered our news coverage, yeah. and they take a look at the week that just passed and mm -hmm. the events that happen uh, in Washington and other political circles, and then they'll take a look at the week ahead. Mm -hmm. in the second half of the program, okay. so it's very successful. You can hear that uh, on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network, 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Saturdays. Okay, and that's Eastern time. That's exactly right. right. And then um, our flagship morning show, Morning Glory, Brian Patrick used to be part of that program. Mm -hmm. It airs Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Eastern time, and we are just thrilled to death to announce the addition of Deacon Harold Burke Sivers to the Morning Glory team. Oh, that's great. Listen, you ain't heard Deacon Harold till you've heard Deacon Harold at 7 a.m. Eastern, which yeah. is 4 p.m. Pacific where 4 he lives. 4 a.m., excuse me, Pacific yeah. where he lives. And it sounds like it's 7 p.m. when he gets on the airwaves and starts uh. cranking it up. So he's paired with Gloria Purvis, who's been on the program from the beginning. Three days a week, we have Monsignor Charles Pope, uh, mm -hmm. who's a blogger with the National Catholic Register, very po popular figure here uh, at EWTN. And then, uh, you know, they have a guest here and there. But generally speaking, uh, we don't do hard news on that show anymore. We've kind of revamped it a little mm -hmm. bit because, you know, we do news uh, with our, our sure, great show, sure. uh, you know, out of Cincinnati in the morning. News Nightly. Uh, news Nightly we have. We have Teresa Tamio that does Catholic Connection, Cresta in the afternoon. We've got a lot of hard news shows. So what Brian, Deacon, Harold, and the priests are doing is they're just kind of having a morning cup of coffee and just having a chat from a very Catholic perspective about the events that are going on in the day. So you can hear that Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio, and you can find out everything else that's going on at EWTN Radio at EWTN.com slash radio. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it very much. I'm really glad about Deacon. He's one of my favorite students that I taught, yeah. and uh, it's good to have him on for that. Now, we will be back in a couple of minutes with tonight's guests, so please stay with us. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome back. Our guest tonight is a Dominican friar who has lived and worked in the Vatican as theologian for the papal household for the last 14 years. He was appointed to that role by Pope Benedict XVI. For the past 25 years, though, he has taught moral theology at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome and also known as the Angelicum. And he's here tonight to discuss 
moral theology in a broader framework than just sins and moral obligations and responsibilities, but to see morality as an avenue for the grace of God to transform human lives and to spark an exercise of faith. He covers this in depth in his book, The Spark of Faith, Understanding the Power of Reaching Out to God, which is available through EWTN's religious catalog. So please welcome Father Wojciech Gertich of the Order of Preachers. Thank you. Father is uh, from, he was born in England of Polish, Polish parentage. Yeah. Yes. But you went to Poland and entered the Dominicans there. Yes. That's a very interesting route because when, what year was it that you entered? In 1970, I went to Poland to study history. And then in 1975, I entered the order. Yeah. So, so this, it was still the communist period. Huh? Yeah, yeah. In Brezhnev and Moscow. I never imagined that I would live in, in, the, in the Apostolic Palace <laughs> at a time when there'll be two popes and none of them are living there and I'm living there. <laughs> well, and, not exactly two popes, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one pope and one, yeah, one pope emeritus. And, um, and I'll, I'll bet that... Uh, you know, the, the folks who were the premiers of Soviet Union in mm. those days never expected there to be a no. Polish Pope no, no. a few years no. after yes, yes, you went yes. to the Dominicans. I was in Krakow at the time when John Paul II was elected, so this was a, a great shock for us because he would often visit our priory as, a, as the local cardinal. But then suddenly when he became Pope, he started speaking in the past tense about him because there was a feeling that we lost him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well... Uh, Poland lost him in a certain sense. But also but gained him in, in yeah, a different the way. Yeah, the world gained him. And uh, he, he always reminded me of someone who was lighting a match in a powder magazine waiting for the explosion <laughs> to go off, and it did. It is, yes. But as papal theologian and, and as a Dominican, yeah. I, your focus is clearly coming from the theology of uh, St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, the, the greatest of the theologians of the church, uh, he and St. Mm -hmm. Augustine are the yeah. two uh, foci yeah. you know, for us. In moral theology, he's a genius, but we need to appropriate it in our own time. How is it that you see moral theology as a way, not just for the rules and regulations, that's, that's always a temptation. Yeah, well for moral theologians to know, how far can I go before it's a okay. sin? Well, that's a Jesuit approach. Well, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. But the Dominicans, on the other hand, see this well, other approach. Tell us well, about that. Well, uh, basically, if you look at various approaches in ethics, some people think that the fundamental issue is exactly as you said, concrete cases. Is it a sin? Is it not a sin? Yes. Other people will focus on the norms and find the ultimate justification of the norms, find some rational arguments which defend the norms. Whereas I insist that St. Thomas gives us a moral theology, and the moral theology is about God. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about how God transforms us from within by grace. And in fact, I like to make a distinction, which not many people do, between three discourses, philosophical ethics, theological ethics and moral theology. And oh, many identify mm -hmm. theological ethics with moral theology. Whereas philosophical ethics views the ethical challenges and tries to understand them. Mm -hmm. Theological ethics views also the moral challenges, tries to understand them, but includes the extra light coming from revelation. So it's like light, lighting a torch, which illuminates what is being seen. What Americans call a flashlight. A flashlight, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Whereas, but, uh, whereas moral theology is focused not on the moral challenge, but on God and on the fecundity of his grace. Mm -hmm. And this is how I read Aquinas, that the whole second part of the Summa, which is the moral section, it's all about the flowering of grace, 
within the internal liberty of the individual who's moved by grace. And that's why the whole focus is on the virtues, mm -hmm. which are the capacity to go for the good, moved by the love of God, and not on sins and not on norms. I, I think, so, so folks understand, with philosophical morals, this is based on natural law and natural oh, yeah. reason. What, what anybody, whether you're a Christian or not, could figure out by careful use of re reason. Theoretically, but with, with difficulty and prone to error. Right. But theoretically, yes, yes, we can use our reason. And of course, the reason is not uh, amputated by faith. And even within faith, we can use the reason so we can understand challenges and try to see what is involved. And theological uh, ethics does use faith and, and what God has revealed well, uh, to well, us I, about uh, right This world. distinction between the three disciplines, I would re reserve the term theological ethics to again an attempt to understand the challenges, but with the torchlight, with the extra light of revelation, which somehow changes also what we see. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the prime focus is still on the moral fact. Mm -hmm. Whereas moral theology, I would like to use the term as a part of theology. Mm -hmm. And theology is about God. And I found in, the, in one of the commentaries of St. Paul to, uh, of, of Aquinas to St. Paul, to the Colossians, a distinction that Aquinas brings in. He says there are three ways of being of God. God is everywhere in a different way. God is present in the soul of the saint, and in a different way, God is present in Christ, in the hypostatic union and in the sacraments. And by hypostatic union, you mean? The union of the divinity and humanity in Christ. Right. So God is everywhere, and so God is in the wood or the metal out of which a tabernacle is made. Mm -hmm. In this sense, just as God is in this cup, in his mug, uh. God is everywhere. In a different way, God is present in the soul of the person who's praying in front of the a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And in a different way, God is present in the Blessed Sacrament that inhabits the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And so this distinction, uh, uh, I think, is the basis of the div division of the Summa of Theology of Aquinas, mm -hmm. where the first part is about God and about creation and about man as man has been created by God. So anthropology, as man came out of the creative hands of God. The second part, we could call it a theological anthropology, but it's about God working within uh, the, the divinized Christian huh, in whom the divine image becomes visible. And the third part is about Christ and the sacraments. Now, when I discovered that, reading uh, the second part of the Summa, suddenly it all comes alive, whether he's discussing the emotions or the moral qualification of the act or particular virtues or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All along, he's constantly talking about God, how God becomes visible in the person who's living out the supernatural life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that we deny the value of, of a reflection of concrete moral cases or, or reflection well, about the moral law. We can do this. But I think in the church, uh, the, 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 the prime need of speaking about uh, what God does to us rather than what we do to God. Mm -hmm. This is a, a very important element. Again, as you say, we do need to understand how to apply, say, the Ten Commandments to concrete situations. That's fine. But you're talking about something where God is transforming us into his image and likeness. We're sinners that God but remember makes the Ten his Commandments are from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Whereas we are living already after the redemption mm -hmm. and the resurrection of Christ. And we received the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gives a commentary on the Ten Commandments, but mm -hmm. within the context of engaging with God and beginning with the promise of the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. And so to go back to the old law or to go back to the natural law, which mm -hmm. the pagans can understand, okay, with difficulty, but they can understand, we're missing out on the... Uh, uh, 
on that which is most important in the Christian message, mm -hmm. which is the redemption, which is the gift of, of God given in Christ, mm -hmm. and the graces which are given uh, the Holy Spirit who's working within us. Mm -hmm. And this has to be articulated in the description of the transformed person as we live out our lives in the various challenges and the difficulties that we have in life and in the creativity which becomes possible in the virtues because the virtues are a capacity to put yourself together to put your emotions your will your 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 reason and to go for the good not because you were told to do so not because you're afraid of sin or afraid of punishment but you do the good because it's worth doing because it's fun doing, yeah. because it's something that you can engage yourself with, with your, and for the love of God, mm -hmm. and for the love of those who are loved by God. I, I think this point that you're making about how virtue does, as a couple aspects that I, yes. I hear you speaking, one, it integrates the human person. Yes and brings together, because uh, one of the problems of a lot of human beings is what some psychologists call compartmentalization. You put little compartments of your life and you don't let them interact, where virtue helps pull you well, together. You, you can discuss uh, specific virtues, you know, chastity or temperance or sobriety, well, then you're looking at some compartment. Mm -hmm. But to make them work, you have to put in the first place the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, which we've received as a gift at, at baptism, mm -hmm. which has been installed in the computer of our soul uh, mm -hmm. and is often forgotten. But when we activate our relationship with God through faith, hope, and charity, then our whole life becomes transformed. And so it's an important point that, first of all, we have to struggle for the quality uh, uh, of the theological virtues and not as many of us received in our childhood primary focus on morals, on, on uh, avoiding sin, mm -hmm. on, on aesthetics and mysticism engaging with God, well that will come when you'll be 80 years old. No, we have to begin using the capacity that we have received from God, the supernatural capacity which enables us to touch God. And the first of the three theological virtues is faith. That's why my book is about faith, mm -hmm. uh, which sparks the, 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 the supernatural life within us. Mm -hmm. Whenever we place ourselves in the hands of God and trust in God, and the mind goes beyond the limits which the reason is capable of controlling, and we go beyond towards the mystery that has been revealed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we love God, because we... Uh, we've received this capacity to believe. And I use the example here of the woman in Capernaum who was suffering from a sickness and she came back behind Jesus and touched the hem of Jesus' cloak with her finger. And Jesus says, somebody touched me. And the apostles are saying, everybody's touching you in the middle of a crowd. No, somebody touched me. She touched Jesus' cloak with her finger but with her faith, she touched the heart of Jesus. And every time that we make an act of faith centered on Jesus, there is a physical contact between our soul and Christ. And there is a, a hidden, subterraneous, but real effusion of grace. And so if we ensure the primacy of the theological virtues and the living out with God, with God through our prayer, through our reception of the sacraments and the maintaining of a lively faith. In time, the other moral problems that the psychologists and the ethicists see, they get resolved. If the, if the, if the fundamental axis is in the first place, the other problems <coughs> in time uh, are worked out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you reverse and you begin with the aesthetics, with the morals, with the purely with the purely natural dimension and leave the supernatural life uh, for some distant future you're constantly going around in circles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and it's and faith is uh, that that first beginning but also there's an absolute need for that divine gift the the theological virtue of hope that there's something more not just because I have optimism, but God gives us hope. 
Well, hope is, uh, is the theological virtue which allows us to accept the mystery which is unfolding in life. Mm -hmm. So is the virtue of the way. Mm -hmm. It helps us to continue the struggle and to go forward, even though we're experiencing difficulties within ourselves and mm -hmm. around us, but nevertheless, don't give up and go forward. And God is surprising us with various uh, changes in our life, but accept that there's a hand of God in there. That's mm -hmm. hope, huh? Yeah. That's in, the theological virtue of hope, which doesn't deny the natural hope, which is called by Aquinas magnanimity, which is the hope that gives you the strength to undertake action, to do something. So we need to have hope that we'll, we'll win an election or we'll pass an exam or we'll get something done or that we'll have a good holiday. Huh? So we have natural hopes, huh? but the th theological virtue of hope is on a different level. Mm -hmm. It's focused on God. Mm -hmm. I, I think when I see a lot of the uh, lack of moral behavior in present society, I see an awful lot of despair. A lack of hope oh, yeah. is very, very prevalent. Yeah. That's why people uh, we, in, in the United States, we've had many cases of people murdering other folks and then killing themselves. They, they, they seem to just have no idea that there's any kind of well, future. Th they've never heard about the supernatural life and the working of yeah. grace within them, which helps them to sort themselves out. Although primarily we shouldn't really think only psychologically, you know, I have a problem and I need to resolve it. God, come and help me mm -hmm. because then I'm in the center. Mm -hmm. We should put it the other way around. We are the children of God and we can relate to God like children in trust and in hope and and if something doesn't work out like a child comes to a father and repair my toy because it's not working huh? this filial trust towards god huh? this has to be put in the center and for children it's easier than for adults mm -hmm. whereas we adults have a difficulty in maintaining mm -hmm. the, the primacy of the theological virtues which allow us to be to continue as a child towards God while we are mature, responsible uh, adults in the face of the challenges of life. And the, the third of the theological virtues is love, charity. charity. And that that kind of charity uh, is also not focused on my psychological state. No, no. Well, again, it's a gift of grace which mm -hmm. enables us to befriend God. Aristotle. Uh, claim that it's impossible to be a friend of God. And he was right on a natural level, mm -hmm. but, but he knew nothing about revelation. Right. Whereas uh, revelation tells us that God has become our friend and we can become the friend of God. And we can live out a relationship of friendship with God and then include other people who are the friends of God in that relationship. Yes. And so when we live out charity, this has an impact on faith. And Aquinas makes a wonderful distinction, which is clear in Latin between the uh, credo deum, credo deo, and credo in deum. Mm -hmm. Credo deum, deum esse, I believe that God exists. Mm -hmm. Credo deo, I believe God, that God is truthful. So I accept what God has said, what is in Revelation. And these two moments are important, but this is not yet the fullness of faith. The fullness of faith is credo in deum, and there we have the accusative case, mm -hmm. which denotes a movement. Yes. The word in can also mean be applied with the ablative case, which denotes a location. Where are the chocolates? The chocolates are in the box. Whereas the in with the accusative case means a movement. Where are you going? I am going into Rome. So credo in deum, which we have in the creed, basically means I believe towards God, mm -hmm. which means I've grabbed myself with all my difficulties and my body and my emotions and my uh, uh, challenges and, and, uh, and, and uh, problems that I have, and I'm moving towards God. Mm -hmm. Why? For the love of God, because God has loved me first. Huh? And, and this enabled me to love him. This, this is exactly what St. John had written in his first epistle, chapter 4. Well, it's not it's so much based, that we love based, God, but, but God that God loved loves us first. Us first. Yeah, yeah. And, and many people have a problem that they think they don't love God enough. But they have to be reminded that, first of all, they have to believe that they are loved by God. 
that this has to be first. And when, when, you, when you become aware of the fact that you're in the hands of God, well then, okay, your, your, your dramas are not so dramatic because we're in good hands, we're in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. Like the good Pope John XXIII wrote in his diary once late at night. Yeah. He looked out of the window and he said, oh, the world is in a mess, huh? but, uh, but it's uh, in God's hands. So, okay, so I'm going to bed. <laughs> you know, you can, be, you can be peaceful because, okay, there is a mess in the world, but we are in God's hands. Huh? Mm -hmm. Going forward, in, you know, you you see that kind of charity as a gift lived out. Uh, well, for instance, today is the feast of Saint Paul Miki and know, many other martyrs, martyrs uh, yeah. Franciscans, lay people yeah. who died in Japan during the persecutions there, and folks could have that love of God in the midst of great pain. But, but it's not. Uh, 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 it's okay. something that that, that that love overcame. But any of the other I think we have to, to believe reject. that the supernatural life that we've received that is real, and that it has a life of its own, a dynamism of its own, of its own. We can imagine sometimes you have a pond with fishes and and bugs flying around and and lots of life in it, and then there's a hot summer, and the pond dries up, and it's completely. You can walk on the, on the, on the ground. Huh? Mm -hmm. It seems to be completely dead, you know. And then suddenly the rain comes back, and again it's all moving. Where, where was this life? This life was hidden, but it was there. Huh? And so sometimes in the spiritual life and the moral life, people are completely unaware of the divine gifts that they've received. Mm -hmm. They're not living them out. They think that they, they have to depend on their own energies, and it doesn't work, and so they're paralyzed by their, by their yeah. sins, and they, they say, well, I'm born this way, I'm, I, that's how I am, nothing will change. And they don't have the energy to struggle because they were struggling, tugging at their shoelaces and couldn't lift themselves up. Whereas you have to but count on God, trust in the power of God, and the supernatural life that you've received is in you. And it can be activated. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one, one of the very important elements of understanding how our relationship with God is His gift. Is his, uh, our capacity for, for living out a relationship with God is His gift because we ourselves cannot move ourselves to the supernatural life. That's and so uh, the heresy uh, which I criticize here in this book of semi-Pelagianism, mm -hmm. which claims we need grace, but the move from disbelief to belief is something which we produce ourselves by our own arguments. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. No, uh, the fact that we can relate to God is already a gift of grace. But whether we use it or not, it depends on our prayer life, um, on our nourishing of the life of faith by, our, by the reception of the sacraments, the reading of the Word of God, being receptive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But this may happen amongst people who've, who haven't had access to the sacraments, who are far away, who had no catechesis, but nevertheless there's a supernatural life in them. Yeah. And you know, this is uh, very much uh, reminded of St. Augustine's wonderful statement, Lord, command what you will, but give what you command. That his gift is what enables us to... But the gift precedes the command. Exactly, exactly. The gift precedes the command, and the right. commands are possible, and the Ten Commandments without the grace of Christ are basically impossible. Right. But to live out the ethos of the Ten Commandments and even more of the Sermon on the Mount, huh? we need the power of grace. Huh? But we need to believe it, that it's available. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, often uh, I, I find it helpful to direct people to contemplate this by looking at Romans chapter 7, verse 14, all the way into chapter 8. Chapter 8 is particularly the descriptive well, of, of, of the, the, the working of the Holy Spirit within us. Right, in, in and 7.14, uh, 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 St. Paul eight. feels that weakness and then says, wretched man, that am, I, am I lost? No. And then he goes into the discussion of the And grace. Romans 8.14 is those of the children of God who were led by the Holy Spirit. Yes. And this is a decisive moment to be attentive 
to what the Holy Spirit is suggesting. Mm -hmm. And if we live that out, if we are responsive to the divine suggestions, then we're living as adopted children of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. We are living as, as the children of God. And this is the initial divine project which God has had in mind before creation, as St. Paul in Ephesians says, God chose us before the creation of the world. Yes. So before Adam, before Adam's sins and my sins, God chose us to become his adopted children through our brother Jesus Christ. Yep. We have to take a little bit of a break. Okay. But we want to come back and... If you have any questions uh, for Father Gertig uh, or those of our folks in our studio audience, um, please uh, do call in and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Father Wojciech Gertig, uh, a Dominican uh, father who is now stationed in Rome, but studied in Poland. And we have a caller today. Uh, Thomas, where are you calling here, from? Father. Calling from Kingsport, Tennessee, Father. Oh, Kingsport, okay. And your question? Well, my question is for Father Gertig. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, okay. That's close enough for country it's, music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here's my question. Well, and Father covered it a little bit today in your show and in his homily this morning. I am one of those habitual sinners who finds myself in confession with the same sin and almost despair sometimes saying, oh, it's just concupiscence and, or I'm, I'm, I'm doomed with this particular sin. But, he, but Father said today, of course, with hope, you can reach perfection. You, with the grace of God, we can reach perfection and we can eliminate uh, this, these habitual sins that we, that we commit and think and fall in despair and think that we are not able to uh, reach that perfection. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Father for some, some tips, and I just mentioned that I have to realize that God loves me more. God chose me first before, before I chose Him, and um, I think that's a very good start. So I'll leave it up to Father now. Great. So, well, we be don't some go, concrete ways or some We helps. don't go to confession to entertain the priest. So the fact that we're repeating the same sins, there's nothing wrong in that. Huh? This is our weakness. This is our, our, our wound with which we come. But in confession, the important moment is not just the forcing of our own willpower or our emotions that I will now improve. The confession is the meeting, this is my weakness, this is the place where I don't know how to resolve it, this is where I'm completely alone. Huh? Mm -hmm. And we're asking the grace of Jesus to come precisely to these wounds and heal them. Whereas the calendar at which stage in our life God will free us from, from these various difficulties, it's not in our hands, it's in the hands of God. And St. Paul had some weakness, we don't know what it was, the, the fawn of the flesh. And he was aware that, um, uh, that he prayed often to Christ and Christ said, there's enough grace for you. Huh? And strength is, uh, in weakness, str uh, we are strengthened. So as we're relating to God, in time we come out of the difficulty, but we cannot impose it upon God. And Aquinas, in his commentary to that line of St. Paul, says that God sometimes allows us to fall 
even to a mortal sin, so that man would recognize that he cannot stand on his own. Mm -hmm. Homo recognoscat sesu is viribus stare non possa. That mm -hmm. man will recognize that you cannot stand on the basis of your own powers. And so the fact that we are going through various purifications and moments where suddenly we are challenged by some difficulties, and this happens in personal life, but also in the community life, in the churches, in the religious orders, mm -hmm. that suddenly there's a crisis and everything seems to be crashing. God is leading us through these difficult moments to force us to a deeper life of faith, a deeper uh, basing ourselves on that solid foundation that is walking on water. St. Peter, when he believed, he was walking on the water. When he stopped believing, he started to sink. Yeah. And we need to learn how to be on the solid foundation that is walking on water. Sometimes in Poland, in the winter, it's possible because the lakes are frozen. <laughs> but but uh, that's a sort of image. But, but we have to learn how to base ourselves on the mystery, which is greater than what we can understand. And then we're inviting the grace of God into that problem. But when will it will be resolved, that's God's issue, not mine. When, uh, I've gone to the Holy Land many times, and when we're on the Sea of Galilee, yeah. I love to read that text and yeah. point out that so long as St. Peter had his focus on, on Jesus, Jesus, he was walking. He could water. walk. When he looked at the waves, yeah. and he started to be in terror, he started to. Sing. That's that's exactly. that's, and this is where, when in going through sin, it's not about looking at my embarrassment that I'm repeating mm -hmm. the sin. Mm -hmm. It's not about what the priest might think mm -hmm. of me. It, it's it, it's not about my schedule. It's focusing on, on God on Himself, uh, on Christ uh, Jesus, and believing in the power of the resurrection, and and not, you know, always being, you know, letting Him lift us back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, Peter didn't lift himself yeah, out of yeah. the water. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Originally yeah. from Boston, though. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> think you sound like you're from Florida. But uh, that's a great town that you're in right now. I love Jacksonville. And your question? My question is, um, in talking about the life of Jesus with some friends, uh, they started to tell me that, that Jesus' blood was God's blood. And God the heaven, Father's God blood? God the Father in heaven, uh -huh. which uh -huh. um, I believe uh, he's spirit. So I didn't, I, I didn't understand that. And I said, but he was born of Mary and I, uh, I'm confused now that well, they, they said that they had it by some authority. Okay. If somebody's giving you that kind of false information, no wonder you're confused. Of course. Father, but the way help out, clarify The way this. out of confusion is to hold on to Catholic doctrine. And the Council of Trent uh, tells us that in the Eucharist we receive the body and the blood, the soul and the divinity of Jesus Christ under the species of the bread and wine. Mm -hmm. So the body and blood and the soul refer to the humanity of Christ and the divinity. Whereas uh, we, we don't claim that suddenly the blood is, is divine. The blood is human. The blood is, 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 uh, 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 is, is a part of the body of Jesus. Yeah. And so this is completely confusing. Yeah. And the other thing too is God the Father did Has not become flesh. Exactly. So he does not, not have, have blood. A human blood. Uh -huh. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, so well, that's, the idea of this being this is completely a, a confusing text. Uh -huh. There was a, another heresy back in the early ch church called patripassionism, which believed that God the, the Father suffered. suffered. Yeah, yeah. No, that was the same mistake. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that that's that's not correct at all. Only the God second the person God the became Father flesh was well pleased seeing the generosity, the gift of self of the Son. And I like to express, uh, explain this sometimes. If a, a, a couple, they have a, a son who becomes a doctor and goes to Africa and dies from some tropical disease, mm -hmm. or the daughter is a, a religious sister and dies in some persecution somewhere. The parents will be sad, but on a deeper level, there will be a certain spiritual joy that the charity that we taught our child has won in the heart of the child, in the total gift of self in that dramatic situation. Mm -hmm. So the Heavenly Father views the gift of self of the Son and sees in Christ's 
a, a, a passion, a moment of spiritual joy huh? mm -hmm. that Christ has given himself with the quality of his charity, which is more powerful than sin and death. Mm -hmm. And in this way, that gift of self of Christ has become a token that we can use mm -hmm. to lift ourselves up from our sinfulness. But it, in no way does no any way. part of the faith um, imply that God the Father no, has blood, has blood yeah, or any other no. aspect no. of and the, and the blood of, And the blood of Jesus is the is human blood. Yep, yep. And that's where that hypostatic union, union yeah. comes in, that yeah. he is God and man. man. Completely, completely God, and completely also, human. And also has two wills, a divine will and a human will. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Sir? Where are you from? Yes, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, also. Are you that lady's faithful sidekick? I absolutely am. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your question? Yes, I, this past week I had an opportunity to have a conversation with, uh, with my younger brother, and he's, he's going through a very difficult time, actually in a, in, uh, in a very despairing uh, point in his, mm -hmm. in his life. He's had uh, serious medical issues all his life, and he's reached the point to where he's he he's he's almost wishing he just simply would uh, you know would die and mm -hmm. uh, end his life so that he can stop this this suffering. In my conversation with him, I tried to uh, to suggest to him that first and foremost he, he needs to return to the to the church, uh, go to confession, uh, let the grace of the sacrament uh, fill his heart, uh, and then he can begin to pursue seeing some redemptive value in, in his lifetime of, of suffering. You if you were counseling someone like this, what additional advice and, uh, and suggestions would you, would you give to someone who's reached this point in their life? Sure. I think what you've said was, was correct. And uh, so I'm not giving any advice of more things to be said, but I would uh, uh, suggest the internal disposition that when we're talking to somebody who has been baptized, we can invite the Holy Spirit into that conversation. And when you're talking to a difficult teenager, for example, going through a difficult stage, but the teenager has been baptized, before you open your mouth, invite the Holy Spirit to be present in that conversation, just as we, before our conversation, we said a prayer. Right. Yeah. Right. So we're inviting the Holy Spirit, uh, and we have to believe in the presence of the Holy Spirit in the other. And then we say what we think is, is appropriate, as you've said, uh, but your words are then nourished by the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe you will not see uh, an immediate result of what you said. Uh, mm -hmm. The person may, again, object and, and be unconvinced or whatever. But if you've invited the Holy Spirit into your words, and the Holy Spirit who's inhabiting the soul of, your, of the person with whom you're speaking, huh, then there, is a, uh, there comes a moment of change. Huh? And, and suddenly the words that you've said sink in. Mm -hmm. And the teenager will rebel, but then talking with their friends, they will repeat everything that they heard from their parents. Huh? Yeah. I, I think, you know, you, you also, in, in entrusting to the Holy Spirit in that kind of conversation, uh, keep in mind that the Holy Spirit acts like the pea underneath the princess's mattress. An old mm -hmm. tale <laughs> about uh, you could tell somebody was a princess because no matter how many thick yeah. uh, mattresses. mattresses they had, if there was a little pea underneath, she's so yeah. sensitive. Yeah. Well. That's a sign of our soul. There's a sensitivity of the soul to God, and that God, our Lord, will work. But, but in our preaching, in, our, in the words that we can say, or even not only in our preaching, but in our uh, active moment of faith, we can elicit, spark the yes. supernatural life yes. in ourselves and in the other as well. Yep. In yep. the other as well. Huh? And it's uh, something uh, also to keep, not only where you focus on asking the Holy Spirit to be present there, but also let them know you're directing them to Jesus Christ. 
sometimes, especially in the present moment, yeah. when you direct them toward the church, yeah, they, they need to be in the church, yeah. but it sounds to a lot of American ears and modern ears like an organizational call. Whereas you keep them focused on the person but, of Christ. But sometimes you won't, you won't speak with the person, huh? but you invite the Holy Spirit. I can give you an example of traveling on the underground, the metro in Rome. And there were two young women with mobile phones and they were giggling and sort of behaving in a very unpleasant way. And they had earrings, uh, not only earrings, but tattoos on their face mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And I had the impression they're probably lesbians in their, in their behavior and so on. That is, and they somehow they were unpleasant in, in their behavior. And remembering what I, what I say here, I say, I, I, they were talking in Italian, so I figured out, well, the Italians, they're probably baptized. So I'll invite the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to change them. But they're still giggling. And then it dawned on me, I remembered what our professor way back in the Angelicum who was teaching about St. Augustine. And he spoke about when Augustine fled from, went from North Africa to Rome as a young man. And this prof American professor was saying when he's seeing young Romans, young men in Rome, he was thinking each one of them could be an, can be an, an Augustine. So I thought, here I am inviting the Holy Spirit so that he would change these women so that they'll behave well and not enervate me on the, on the metro. Well, I'm using the Holy Spirit for my own needs. Mm -hmm. No, I have to invite the Holy Spirit that they will be saints. Yes, yes. And in my internal prayer, I prayed that they will be saints. And immediately something as if these two women were struck, they put away their, they became serious, they put away their mobile phones, their, their behavior somehow changed. And then a few stations later, they got off the train. <laughs> so, but, it's a sort of almost an immediate reaction, like that woman in Capernaum, that she believed in Jesus. And there was an immediate effusion of grace. Yeah. So when we invite the Holy Spirit for the good of the other, mm -hmm. believing in the power of grace, there is a hidden working of grace. I didn't say a word to them. I, I, yeah. But there is a, this is, the, the, we have to believe that we've been given the tool to bring the grace of God here. Yep. And that is our faith. Yep. Let's take another phone call. Hello, John. Hello, Father Mitch. Hey, how are you? What, can, what do you have as a question today? Uh, it's for both of you. What, what is the first name of our guest priest? Uh, Fa Father Wojciech? Yeah. Uh, well, I would ask Father Wojciech to uh, give us some knowledge about theology according to St. Thomas Aquinas. And for you, since I know uh, Francis can be dear to you, uh, any theology you may know from St. Bonaventure, who was Franciscan. Well, f oh, keep in and, mind, uh, John, I'm not a Franciscan. <laughs> I don't know that stuff. Oh, well. Okay. Well, I'm a Franciscan, and I don't know, too. <laughs> well, of course, the theology of Aquinas is, is very, very uh, enormous. But since he brought St. Bonaventure, I'll uh, show a distinction between Bonaventure and Aquinas uh, about the virtues which handle the emotions. So the virtues of temperance and fortitude. Now St. Bonaventure held that temperance and fortitude are located in the will. So by willpower, they have to handle the rebellious emotions. So Aquinas disagreed. He said the virtues of temperance and fortitude are not in the will, but in the emotions themselves, because they have an internal disposition to cooperate with reason and with grace. Huh? And so it's not a question of ramming your emotions by sheer willpower, huh? but uh, the grace of God is working within our bodiliness, within our emotions, and so the person who has the uh, who's handling the emotions well, huh? has this sincere liberty and joy and freedom, and it's not in a constant tension mm -hmm. fighting against the rebellious emotions uh, because they are already pacified. And that's why Aquinas says that perseverance is not really a virtue, because if you have to struggle, you're not yet virtuous. Huh? 
And if you have the virtue of studiositas, of being studious, which refers not only to studies but also to art, you know, a sculptor who's doing something, mm -hmm. whatever, it's not that you have to force yourself with perseverance to do it. You are drawn by the beauty of the object, huh? yeah. the thing which is attracting you. So the virtue is an internal capacity to go for the good because it's worthwhile doing, because it's, it's attractive, because yeah. the good is... Well, so this is a difference between Bonaventure and Aquinas. But, uh. I'll leave you with that. Uh, we have just a couple minutes. Uh, Bob, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Florida, Father, and Father Wojcik and Father Mitch. I have a quick question for you. I'm just wondering, is there absolute truth to our faith and is there any room for change to traditional church teaching right now? Because I think a lot of us are worried about that and concerned about certain areas. And okay. uh, I would like the Father to, to address that in terms of the Vatican, and if you don't right. mind. So yeah. we have so about a minute or so. Basically, uh, uh, the, the, uh, what we teach is all based on Christ. Uh, so there is no change. But there are new challenges there are new resistances against the faith. Uh, so there has to be a reflection. And what are the typical resistances against the faith in Africa, in China, in America? They're different. And so theologians and pastors and bishops and have to reflect upon this and to unpack the truths of faith and see within the great uh, uh, treasures of the faith answers to these specific questions. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, there is movement and development. But it's not the inventing of something completely new. And Cardinal Newman said that St. Peter would give the same answer uh, to the questions that we have today, huh? if he would understand the issue. Huh? Uh, the issues are new, but the principles are the same. And so basically, it's all in the teaching that we have in the church from the times of the apostles. It, it, and so that remains the same, just how we apply yeah. it in yeah. circumstances. I want to encourage you to get Father's book. It's called The Spark of Faith, Understanding the Power of Reaching Out to God by Father Wojciech Kertich. And that is available at ewtnrc.com. It's item 80688. Thank you, Jinkui Thank you. And if you would join me in giving a blessing to our audience, May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we were able to bring you Father Wojciech Yertich and all the other guests who come on this show and all the other shows only because this network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you and God bless.